So this is an interview with Spike from Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, but we ended up getting another guest that we had no idea was going to be sitting next to him. Yeah, um, a little hint, ladies and gentlemen. He was the bass player in one of the greatest bands of all time. I believe the number two band in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and is the only person in the world, I think, who has ever told Mr. Burns to go to hell, you old bastard. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Rockman Power Hour. I'm Jason Rockman, your host, and my co-host, Ryan Stick. Uh, today, we are going to be chatting with um, some really, really rad dudes. We thought we were just going to be chatting with Spike from Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, which we are, um, but we also got an extra special guest that we don't want to tell you who it is. Ah, fuck it. We'll tell you who it is. CJ Ramon from the Ramones is here as well, and uh, we didn't know, but he's playing with Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, and... Um, Listen, this is going to be a great, great conversation. Uh, we go in all kinds of directions with this one, from food to comic books to being punk rock and authentic and loving or hating Steely Dan. So I uh, <laughs> hope you enjoy it. But we want to thank our uh, title sponsor, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. They have always got our back. I'm holding the Poirier Louisiana-style KO edition. This is Dustin Poirier, yes. That Dustin Poirier from the UFC's signature hot sauce, and it is all done through Heartbeat. Um, check them out at heartbeathotsauce.com. And if you use my promo code Rockman20 right there, that'll get you 20% off your entire order. Also, Ryan, what are you rocking today? Because I got scanners on. Dude, I was so stoked when this came in the mail. I am rocking the yeah. first and only shirt of SLC Punk I've ever, I got to give this a close up, I've ever seen yeah. in oh, my wow. life. Nice. And uh, that is great. I used, I got to tell you, as much as I listen to me first in the Gimme Gimmies and all the Fat Records bands back in the day, um, my buddy Robin and I also watched SLC Punk on loop. We ran today. Yeah. We got obsessed with it. And the ironic thing is that when we were a teenager, we loved the entire movie except the ending. And now that I'm a grown ass <laughs> man, I Love really the like the ending. <laughs> so, you know, versus like, it's funny. It's about perspective. And I think I think it's great that the movie was made like that. If we can ever talk to anybody from SLC Punk, I would love to talk to them to death well, about that kind of we'll, thing. Yeah. We'll make it our mission. So thanks to Studio House Designs go. for always making us look fresh. Um, so yeah, Ryan, without any further ado, I want to re jump right into this. The band is on tour right now. Um, they're going to be playing Montreal October 9th. And uh, if you can get tickets, go do so because they're one of the best live bands you'll ever see. They're fun. Um, they're tongue in cheek, but they play um, like they're, they they play like they mean it. And the band is me first in the Gimme Gimmies. Check out our interview with Spike and CJ Ramon. Yeah, so we um we met Spike at 77 with Melanie. And uh and I remember talking to you in catering, and it was I just really, really thought you were just a really interesting, genuine, nice guy. And uh, I don't know if you remember, we had, <laughs> are you, you're not agreeing or are you, are you saying, yeah, he is. Yeah, hey, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I meant to be a little bit uh, ambiguous, I guess, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't really say it's, I, it's not for me to say. Well, I can tell you that after, after you can talk to my wife, well, she after... might tell you a thing or two, hmm. you know, I can code switch with the best of them, man. Like and pretend to be a decent person well you were you were very you were more than decent when we chatted that day and um and i remember saying to melanie you know if i ever get a chance to talk to spike um formally when something's going on around me first um please give me that opportunity and and this came up so i'm really really happy to have you on the show and you've brought someone else along i i have indeed i mean he came of his own volition i don't bring him anywhere man this dude <laughs> like you know I, I, I'm appreciative that you're both here. Um, and you know, you got a show coming up this weekend in Montreal. This podcast is heard all over the world, but we, Ryan and I are from Montreal. So obviously this means a big deal that you guys are coming to Montreal. Uh, there's something about this band when they perform live that people lose their shit. And it's almost like a, a me first and the gimme gimme show is an event. Um, can you, can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, I mean, I can't not as a consumer, you know, like, 
So people that I know that that uh, that come to the show and say why they enjoy it, it's just because it's kind of carefree. Like you're not there to support us. You know what I mean? Nor would we want you to be. You know, people talk about like support the scene, which generally means going to see bands that you don't like. You know what I'm saying? But right. like in this case, uh, it's the songs are already done. Like it's 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 as uh, low impact for the consumer as it is for us. Well, you know, and that's the thing. You know, there there are, there are so many things about playing covers that musicians will say like, Oh God, like I've, I've really just, there's a weird spot for musicians. A lot of musicians that don't, you know, and, and I'm talking from, from a point of view of being a, a, you know, a musician who was out there at one point promoting original music, touring, doing the deal. You know, um, I yeah. did that for like 11, 12 years. And I know, I know what it's like being an original band. And there's, there's a part of, you know, joining the wedding band and joining a cover band, which is kind of like, Oh, it's like this sad thing where I don't want to be, a regular nine to five guy, but I'll do the cover thing. But there's this thing that's kind of frowned upon, but you guys have managed to make this an actually a cool thing. And, and that's what I think is the most interesting thing about this band. You've taken doing covers and you've made it your own, but in a way that it's cool. It's not like, Oh shit, we're a cover band. Like it's more like, Oh shit, these guys are a cover band and you do it well. So the, the, the way you describe it being like low impact. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's very, very well said. Thank you. It, um, you know, I'm not uh, bringing up David Bowie to compare ourselves. What I will say, though, is that Ziggy Start Like That is a man and a group and an artist that not only wrote his own material and developed his own material, but then knew that even though he had run 100 miles, he still had one to go and developed a whole stage persona and a whole visual element which is, I think is really important. I think too much, there's been too much stress on realness. Yeah. Like, especially in the so-called punk scene, you know, like, I mean, like it's not garbage strikes, you know what I mean? In 1976 England, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's kind of like less colorful deadheads in the first place, but like the, the whole notion of realness, like no matter what, it's a proscenium arch. If you were on the floor in somebody's basement playing, like it, you know, it's not real. It's it's not it's it's still it's like a some sort of forced uh what's the word? Uh it's subterfuge, you know what I mean? Like it's not getting you your it's not reality. Yeah, it's enhanced reality, you yeah. know? And therefore, like the hives to me, the hives were like the best looking yeah. and the but you know, and I love their music too. Mm -hmm. And that's not to diminish that great Benny Vidi vicious record which i think is such a wonderful record sure. but they also had like as far as like the way they dressed they had like a cover band that's that's that style yeah they had style yeah they had style that when you see it when you're watching a band something about hearing music and watching the people playing it if they are even if they're not in a uniform at least if they're in like outfits that like coordinate with one another mm -hmm. and and uh, and and something to look at on the stage i think that's a that's an important element that too many people overlook yeah and 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 there's something about finding the balance like I'll, I'll just throw this name out there one of the guys i find that's been able to find that beautiful balance of of looking good and being stylish but yet having cred is dennis from refused um you know i look at dennis and he goes up there and he's got a way about him and and i, ca I call him the james brown of hardcore you know he's just got the moves he's got the style but the music has the integrity so it, it and and that is, it's really funny you say that because Me First has found that kind of vibe where you guys can keep it real, but still look fucking sharp. Oh, right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thing, like man. the realness is not, is not what we aim to do, yeah. you know? But it comes across, I think the, the, the trick to being cool is not trying to be cool. And that is how right. you, that's how you achieve maximum coolness. Yeah. Yeah. As a nerd who always tried to be cool, you know, <laughs> myself, like it, it, uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. Once I stopped worrying about what people thought, you know, it, it my life certainly improved. Yeah. I got cooler. Something I loved about me first in the gimme gimme is back when uh first discovering them, my friend brought over the CDs like, dude, all the fat records dudes got together and they play these amazing cover songs. 
And I always like to think of Fat Records as just a bunch of, of people hanging out and all the other bands knowing each other and just hanging out, getting drunk, playing a couple of cover tunes. And that's kind of what made on the record. Um, Sp Spike, I heard a really cool story that you were kind of a Fat Rec employee that found yourself in that band. I've always wanted to know how the hell you became a gimme gimme and uh, how you, you caught the attention of some of the best in the business and they chose you to be their singer. It probably all started when I, because I was working in shipping and receiving, um, and I sent a whole shipment of merchandise. I forget what band it was. It may have even been No Effects. It may have been the boss's fucking band, man. And <laughs> I mailed it to the wrong continent, and um, not just to the wrong location or the wrong country, to, to the wrong continent. <laughs> and they knew that they had to, you know, and I don't think he wanted to just like summarily fire me because, you know, they were worried about, you know, they liked me. So they, they found a different, a different job for me. That's essentially it, you know, and I would sing Stevie Wonder and Alice Cooper tunes in the warehouse. Yeah. So they thought okay. like we, they had this idea for a cover band again, because it was low impact because their bands were like, they had a lot of anxiety and agitation um, and a lot of pressure from both from within the group, from without the, you know, all these people counting on people to like, I mean, writing stuff is not something you just sit down. I mean, I guess some people can sit down and do it, but it just like, it either comes to you or it doesn't like, no matter how like you much you sit down and concentrate, at least for myself in the times that I have tried to write songs, like it just doesn't, it's not a question of sitting down and working hard, you yeah. know, it's yeah. a question of if something occurs to you, it could be like four in the morning and you're sitting in bed, you know, but. Well, and, and writing, writing original music, I'm, I'm sure as you both know, um, it's a gigantic pain in the fucking ass. I mean, it's great, but it is, there's a lot of moving parts, but the idea of being able to go and play music that you, that you love and that crosses genres and crosses decades. And, and it, I mean, that's, that's the magic of the band. I mean, you guys can play, something from any decade and make it your own because there is a sound to the band there there is there is i would say that generally speaking i would say if there's any sort of like um like categorically speaking if there's a chemistry uh like prerequisite it's that at least initially if i didn't like the song there's a good chance that it was going to make a good cover <laughs> you know because am rock was not really my thing i don't know what was your thing with did you like am rock growing up i hated it like neil diamond was not my thing what, what you know? so how ame would you get like would you are you a steely dan guy no okay but would i you, mean like i'll listen you... to it i mean i guess ironically i don't know if it's a guilty pleasure or you know but some of those songs are truly offensive you know <laughs> what i mean like any major dude come on man like it, and but we got a little surprise. Speaking of Steely Dan, tell me we got news. a little surprise for for Montreal uh, yeah. or Boston. I don't know what. Uh, well, both in both instances, we have uh, a surprise. I'll just put it that way. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Are you doing? Are you doing the Dan? Doing the Dan? <laughs> yeah, we're doing something to the Dan. <laughs> Maybe doing a little dirt to the Dan. You're doing a little dirty work. <laughs> It's a little love, dirty work. I love how you. I love how a you go for any. Do. I love. I love how you go for any major dude because I mean that is you know that's 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 mm. low bearing that's low bearing fruit man that's true that's not one right. I mean it's and these guys are lucky that that's not the song I picked. You know what I mean? They did because it's it, it is truly offensive. Are you are you <laughs> as are you as um uh, easily offended by Steely Dan or are you more easy going with that? Am I? Yeah. A Steely Dan fan? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't call myself a fan exactly. <laughs> but um certainly can appreciate the musicianship. That's what I was gonna um, say. That, that across I mean, you gotta appreciate the musicianship because these guys were just complete studio nerds that had the best of the yeah. best playing on their records and and you know, Michael when you when you figure Michael McDonald was doing backups for them and that guy went on to do a couple of things, like it's it's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But a, a love song that. by a bunch of studio nerds is kind of contradictory from the start. So, yeah. I'm not, you know, I, I don't, I, I can't say I'm actually a fan, but um, I can appreciate um, so, some of what he, they did in the song. 
Mm. It, you know, and there's some transgressive elements too. They were named after a dildo, yeah. right? Which is pretty crazy. Yeah, and the, the thing that's the thing with Steely Dan is that they get dismissed sometimes as these AM rock guys, but there's a lot of double entendres going on in the music. There's a lot of really dark themes in the music that come across as this happy AM shit. But you know, like you said, Spike, you know, they're named after a fucking dildo that you know from, yeah. a, Bur- from a Burroughs book. So right off the bat, you're you know you're going into you're, you know you're going into something that has more meaning to it than I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> they were their ages. They were like a light rock limp biscuit of their time. <laughs> I love. <laughs> light rock limp That's a quote. Biscuit. That is a quote. We're using that. Um, all right. So so basically, but but what's great about that is it's. It, I imagine it's great ground for you guys to find stuff to fucking turn on its head and make it your own. Yeah. All those bands. Like, you know, you're doing. Comic- I would say that. I feel at our best. We stick with the AM rock or the AM style yeah. rock because it's it's just such it's so. I mean, I don't know if upsetting is the word for people <laughs> when they hear it in that idiom. It, it's not it's not supposed to be that way. And then in some cases. It's, you know, you're playing it, like, say, to people our age or younger, you're playing it, like, in their idiom. And then people older like it because they recognize the song itself. So, yeah. like, one of the cool things um, about the band when, when people first started listening to it was that it was multi-generational within one household. People that could kind of, you're listening to this song? Like, you know. Yeah. That's kind of nice. And and that there are people of all ages coming to the shows. One of the best things about going to like certain like I think mainly like Southern Europe, when you go like you go to punk shows and it's like five years old to ninety-five years old. Yeah. Everybody is there. Sure. So it's sort of like there there there's a little bit of an inhibition to like fuck up too hard, which is what it which is an element about punk shows that I don't particularly like and rock shows for that matter too, but that, that I don't particularly like because it's generally like white dudes, you know what I mean? Fucking up. And it kind of looks different. It's not a good look. You know what I mean? Like, like what are you so angry about? You know, yeah, yeah. I got to like humiliate somebody or, you know, beat somebody up. Uh, something amazing happened today where um, I was re listening to a bunch of the music. Like I said, and if, been a fan since the late 90s and um i was listening to this cover and i remembered i'm like god i love the fact that they would start off songs as kind of like little mini pocket punk cover songs and then put it into something else so you start off with i believe it was beat on the brat for a baseball bat by the ramones and then go into sloop john b by the beach boys yes. which the Ramon, which you know the guys were heavily influenced by back in the day and they then work. I see this, the two of you in front of me today. I'm like, God, it, that is just one of those crazy things where, um, how the, how the heck did the two of you guys pair up here? Because, uh, seeing you two together sitting here right now, is making me grin ear to ear. And, uh, I would love to hear the story of how uh, CJ joined the fold here. Uh, I think our people talk to his people and then, something. <laughs> but no, Steve Soto, I gotta say is like, he has been instrumental mm-hmm. to so many uh just making the music world smaller mm. and hooking people up with other people that uh you know that they all you don't know this dude like he got my other band Yukunt a drummer he's responsible for introducing me to these Panamanian guys that I've been playing boleros with he got us together he like you know because Steve played in his band in CJ's band all over the world um and so and the first thing you want to know about somebody, and I'm, I know he wanted to know about us, like, are they okay to travel with? Like, okay, sure, like, they can play, but, like, am I going to want to kill them in a week or something like that? And so I'm sure he was assured probably by Steve that we were decent people and uh, and vice versa. And, and, yeah, I guess that was about it. Yeah. Then we met. You came to my house. That's about it. The rest was history. And then we started traveling together and, uh, and he's a rock. He's one of not, not just a good, like tolerable travel companion, but somebody that like that enjoys facing the challenges and the struggles of every day touring. And then, and then some really big things pop up invariably every day is a struggle. And then 
big things pop up too, but some people just kind of relish it. And, you know, I usually sleep through them. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, you know, that's not true. That's not true. He, he grits his teeth and, and, and TCBs. Um, and it's good to travel with somebody like that. It's reassuring. But it, I, realistically for me, uh, like after the Ramones, I went out and did my solo thing and uh, for a bunch of years and, I got to the point where that was um, that was just becoming more and more of a struggle, and it, it it was kind of an odd thing to think of what I would do with the last you know couple decades of my life. I was like, well, you know, I guess I could just hang out and get a fishing boat and stay out on the water or something, you know. But um, getting uh, the opportunity to play with the Gimmies was not something I saw coming down the pike, uh, but. Now that I'm here, I really can't imagine what else I would have done musically because this has got to be the most fun I've had playing music since you know I first got to the Ramones. This is absolutely the entertainment value alone of the live shows and and watching people sing the lyrics very earnestly and meaningfully while we are pretty much sticking a finger in their eye yeah, it, and beating the shit out of each other in the pit. Right. It's a very Manilow song. I mean, you cannot, you're not going to get that anywhere else playing for any other band. So I, I really do appreciate um, <laughs> the opportunity to experience this side of music um, and, and be, but yet still be doing what I came up doing, which is playing punk rocks. Right. Right. And it's gotta be, um, you know, the the thing about this band too is there's always been some really really monster players that have played in Spike's band. You know you've always had some oh, yeah. real you know and, and and it's you know you, you got one of them that was in the band for a while that went on to be in one of the biggest bands in rock and roll right now. You know um, yes. So and and of course you know you got Jay from Bad Religion and and so a lot of people have been in this band. Um, so it's got to kind of be. It's got to say something about what you put together, Spike. It's it, people have got to be. It, it's it's got to give like people want people gravitate towards this just as players too. They want to be a part of this because it's like you said, it's fun. That's what I find so unique about your band. And I and I said at the beginning, you guys have done something that would seem so fucking obvious, but you guys have done it. Like a lot of people, it, it would be obvious to start a fun cover band and put it on its ear and make it make it different, but no one did it. But you guys have. I, I don't know anyone else. The only other band that I know that does this to to um you know kind of success would be that band yachtly crew who i don't know if you know them, i've heard of them yeah and they're pretty yeah. they're pretty fucking good but they they lean heavy on the schmaltz you know mm -hmm. you guys right. you guys steer away from it and make it your own but so well, yeah we're pretty schmaltzy yeah like, you're we, schmaltz, we are with yeah. like it's there's definitely schmaltz <laughs> that's chicken fat isn't it isn't it schmaltz is. chicken fat? Yeah. <laughs> i bet you didn't think you were going to come on this interview today and hear schmaltz <laughs> Schmaltz, Steely no. Dan. I'm no, but shit. yeah. But you guys have Schmaltz in Montreal, right? What's we got the all kinds. Of meat? Schwartz's, uh, Schwartz's, Schwartz's, yes. Schwartz's. Uh, and, and then there's a place across the street called the Main Steakhouse that also has smoked meat. So uh, you know, everyone can eat. <laughs> no one. Well, and and we're we're going to talk about food because I know um, you're a big food. At the vinyl records too. Yes, we've got it's right around there too. I think. We've got great record stores in Montreal. And we've got a great Absolutely. food scene. And I know that you're, um, I don't know about you, CJ, but I know you, Spike, are into, um, you're a foodie. Um, I know we have a friend in common um, who owns Maison Public. Um, Absolutely. Derek and I are great friends. And uh, there's something special about this, about the city we live in, Montreal, Ryan and I. Oh. The, the food scene is just fucking bad. Undoubtedly, yes. Have you gotten to participate as well, CJ, in Montreal for food? Have you gotten to participate in the food? Like, have you gotten to? Have you enjoyed the food scene in Montreal? Uh, my uh, my dad's family is actually from Saint Joseph the Beauce. Okay, so I so you know I spent lots of time in Montreal and Quebec City from when sure. I was a kid. Right. So right. yeah, I've I've partaken in it's just about all the experiences <laughs> you can have in Montreal. Yeah, and which, which are you great. You could just eat Italian food there, and you could and and it's still like some of the best on the continent. You know what I mean? Like Bottega pizza is, is some of the best pizza I've had outside of Naples. Yeah. Um, the bagels, the bagels, bagels, bagels are phenomenal. Uh, 
You, you walk into any cafe over there, like around St. Laurent and San Zotique over there yeah. and get Spogliatelle and, and Seppoli and all the great, like Neapolitan pastries. The coffee is great. Um, it's, it's bananas. I went to Rome for the first time um, in May with my wife and, you know, everyone's going on about how great the food is in Italy. And I went and, I, and the food was phenomenal, but it was nothing I hadn't tried in Montreal already. Right. Um, which... Right. Absolutely. Yes. No, it, it, and, and especially like the Southern, like the Neapolitan, because there's just so many Neapolitan and unlike New York or San Francisco, for example, the little Italy is not either gentrified or like eaten up by a different community. Like in, in San Francisco, for example, it's like a few blocks of like restaurant row and then Chinatown all around it. You know what I mean? And, sure. and then I think New York is kind of the same, same thing. And, uh, there it's like, it's just a whole neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's people live in, they don't just go to restaurants there. They live there. They work there. It's yeah, no, I definitely, I got it. The one thing I got to object to, to the foodie appellation, man, because yeah. I work in, in the back of the house, you know what I mean? So I think like at that point, you get to not be called. Uh, no, definitely. You know what but, I mean? but if you maybe, have skin in the game, if a little bit of skin in the game, or you're not you have that skin in the game, you know what I mean. Not, not. I, I, I you're a food enthusiast. You know what I mean? You, it's not your fault for calling me that. I'm just yeah. saying, like, I don't want to be lumped in with some of the people that call get called oh, foodie. You listen. know what I'm saying? Like, self consciously, like, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. a foodie. Like, yeah, man, yeah. don't hmm. say that. You know you're what a, I mean? You're, you're a food enthusiast. Uh, yes, I love food. I love cooking it. I just made sausage and peppers today that I hope to get to because we were just in Pittsburgh yesterday with some of the best Italian, like at least like the raw products, you know what I mean? Sausage and cold cuts and cheese. Pennsylvania macaroni is one of the best delis yeah. uh, that I've seen on the continent. The only thing I've seen that comes close is Corti brothers in Sacramento, strangely, but, um, and not only a food town, Montreal is also a comic book town, man, which I really appreciate yeah. too. Yeah. You heard of Chester Brown? Yes. Have you read his latest book that were not the latest one, but the one, but paying for it? No, Ryan. No. Oh, no, so good. Not yet. So good. Well, tell, tell, tell us, tell our viewers about it. it, it it's his life as a John. So oh. he, his girlfriend breaks up with him. Yeah, yeah. But he still lives there because the dude is from outer space. So he doesn't <laughs> have like these same jealous feelings. He's just happy for like for his girlfriend having found somebody else, but he's sad and lonely. And at some point she gets a boyfriend that comes to the house, that that a live-in boyfriend, and he's still there. At some point he realizes he has to move out. And so he starts frequenting uh working girls <laughs> and starts forming relationships with them that are something more than transactional right and starts to develop this kind of like this sort of like socio-political worldview towards it while he's still in it and like not to think that it's just some kind of like wholesome like political treatise yeah. it's still like a dirty underground comic book in like the Zap comics, yeah, Robert yeah. Crumb sure, kind sure. of vein, of which which is like a necessary precondition for me to enjoy those kinds of things. Like it's yeah. got to have a little bit of that, and it certainly does. And his drawing is just so beautiful. The appendices are like that, like not wow. just like the body of the of the graphic yeah, book, yeah. but like the actual like of him defending the profession arguing about why it doesn't need government interference like you know like i want it legal and i want the government out of it like that's his attitude towards it it's 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 fascinating and he sits down in the comic book he throws his friends under the bus so you know that guy <laughs> seth that's not from montreal he's from toronto but i guess they're buddies because yeah. they're all on, on drawn and quarterly yeah um he sits down with that guy joe matt who does peep show comic books. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if you've seen his yep. stuff too. Ryan and I are, um, we're both involved with the Montreal, well, with several comic cons in Canada. So all that drawn and quarterly and all those that like, we know a lot of those cats and, and it's, yeah. um, it's, just, I didn't know you were, you were a comic book fan. I had no idea. That's great. That kind of comic book fan. Yeah. Like I don't really like superheroes or anything, but I love like, 
Robert Crumb and Charles mm. Burns and, you know, and then some of those people, Peter Bag and Klaus, and some of those people are responsible for some of the best record covers, you know, mm. yeah. of like the 80s or 90s or, you know, what's the Iggy Pop on the Brick by Brick? That's Charles Burns. But yeah. So he's sitting down at a table with those guys. And if you've read, read Joe Matt, like, you know that, like, it's totally confessional, uh, like, shit that maybe you or I wouldn't confess, you know, about, like, his dealings with girlfriends and, like, hookups and stuff like that. But then this dude, Joe Matt, apparently has a problem and is kind of prudish about what Chester Brown is getting into, at least according to the comic book. Okay. You know, and it, it just it's really it's a really interesting book. And that dude is a really interesting dude. I've loved him ever since uh I don't know if it was Yummy Fur or uh but he's done a lot of great books before that too. It's just amazing that the comic book medium has gotten into a place and always kind of has been where you can have stories like that with ultimate creativity and no limits. And in fact, it's the easy it's easier in some ways to uh, make a comic book than produce a television show because it could be a singular vision for an artist and a writer and uh you know creativity can be opened up like that like jason and i i was telling him about an idea i had for like a movie he's like well we could make that into a comic book and that thought i'm like oh that's true we can find someone to draw this way more than we can find somebody to you know locations all that yeah. you're bogged down and that's kind of why some comic book adaptions in the superhero way is always the lesser version of what originally was imagined on that page and to begin with yeah so it's really cool i like what you're saying to me right now because now there's an even deeper well of comic book fandom that i want to find myself into right now and like if you did a comic book you'd be storyboarding a movie maybe hmm. even because american splendor hmm. for example became yeah, yeah. a movie i just have not seen like i would hope that somebody is ambitious or like some rich kid has enough money to do like black hole by charles burns or right. like velvet glove cast and iron by or or uh hate comics do the buddy bradley story yeah you know what i mean like i would like i would love to see that yeah either like a cartoon or a live action sure. i guess they did ghost world but ghost world didn't really i liked it but it didn't really yeah it, i mean it, for some reason it didn't capture the the spirit of the of the of the like printed mm. I think, you know, I, I think one of the best adaptations that I've seen from a comic book to screen that's pretty much been no holds barred, and it is in the superhero genre, is The Boys. I mean, The Boys has been, I don't know if you've caught The Boys. The Boys is no holds barred. I watch it. I've never seen it. It's I mean, funny. I've never read it. It's, okay. it's, it's great. And it's really close to, you know, the, the original the original idea i mean they really they don't they don't they don't pull any punches at all it's no. amazing that it's amazing that this thing got fucking made yeah, yeah. that's pretty hardcore <laughs> it is great and evil and you know very human um i, I you know i don't want to keep you guys too long because i know you guys are on the road right now but um you will be coming to town uh to montreal this weekend and um in terms of like where the band's going um do you do you foresee that now that everything's kind of opened up and the world's somewhat back to a normal place, you guys are going to go full tilt? Because I'm, I imagine you have you were. I don't, and I hate to, because everybody's still talking about this, but I imagine the last couple of years were a bit of a shit show for you as well, professionally in terms of fine. Yeah. So, are is the plan to just go like now that this is open, go full steam ahead and 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 tour as much as you can? That was really, really cute. I mean, you know, as long as they're offering, you know, it's it's not really a decision right. that we necessarily make uh, because just as is generally true, like with musicians, they, they are just, it's not the most educated uh, of guesses or, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, you know, yeah, I'm going, you know, but do they want you to come? You know, right. like that, that's ultimately what, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I'm ready to to tear my fellow human being down again. You know what I mean? Like, it's been three years. So, you know, I'm ready to act like an arrogant prick, man. I feel like I earned it, man, this last <laughs> three years. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to cut people off in traffic. And, and uh, like, just the other day, I detuned the opening band's uh, instruments, man, because they're too good. 
Did you did really? The black you, tones. Yes, the black you, tones. You didn't and, do. You didn't do that. You're just kidding. Did you really do that? Well, I mean, I would do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe I didn't do it, but uh, <laughs> but so the black tones is really great band from Seattle. Yeah. Um, they brought their mom out. It's twins. Um, the singer, guitar player, and the drummer are twins. Bass player is excellent too. And uh, they didn't want to leave their mom home alone, so they brought her out to play the tambourine. And she's the one that gets the biggest applause pop out of anybody in the band. Um, she's a funky mom, too. She plays the tambourine and just, like, just barely moves, barely talks, but commands the stage. And uh, uh, Son Rompe Pera are a band from Mexico City that play cumbia and are kind of, like, part of that new cumbia renaissance i guess it's not that new but um uh they, they play sort of like classic cumbia but in a fast punk vein as well and the two dudes play this beast of a marinda marimba two of these guys like syncopated with each other and it's like it's hypnotizing like and they're so good and so energetic and i think like they're doing like that they were coming directly off another tour to do this one. And then they left, they're leaving immediately. I think in like a couple days to like go to Guadalajara then Los Angeles and Europe and wow. you know, yeah. And they're really worth watching, man. Both of, of the bands that are, that are playing before us are, are definitely like, it's a fun night of music. I think that's another, you know, without wanting to be too critical, you know, but, I think a lot of punk bands, for example, or punk promoters uh, also, they love to book things that sound the same. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't, it's not, it's like, it, like people don't support the scene anymore because it's not really, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean the same thing as it did. You know, like it, it, like Ronald Reagan, you know, and since then, we had Clinton, Barack Obama. It's like a whole different set of challenges. You know what I mean? And and they like supporting the scene is not something that somebody that works hard all day wants to do. They yeah. maybe want a little bit of escape. Being thought provoking is good, but without like being entertaining or without creating that kind of sonic buzz, you know, that gets somebody south of their brain. Like they're not going to come out yeah. and pay money, you know, hard earned money to see music you know and besides like all the, one of the reasons all those punk bands in the 80s were so successful was because they were good and they, they did resonate in this part south of the brain at the same time that they were able to get their sort of like political and philosophical ideas out but mm. i think now it's just sort of like it's your duty to come see my band full of like angry middle class white dudes you know what I mean? Like, where were you, man? You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's different. So, having a, a diverse bill, I think it's 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 fun for me to watch too. Well, I think it, yeah, and I think it has to be genuine. And I think it, it it you know there I know exactly what you mean about this whole like oh you 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 know you have to support you have to be there and and no people want to go have fun. You know, people work yeah. at jobs all day. They want an escape. And I think that's what you guys provide is an escape and to give people a chance. You know, the the whole idea of going to see a band um, that you enjoy, bring out a band that they enjoy. That's that I've always thing. loved, you know, I've always loved, you know, like whenever I would go see, you know, Mr. Bungler, Faith No More, they would always bring a band you never heard of that they loved. And they didn't care if you fucking like them or not. They like yeah. them. And in turn, the people that love them would be like, you know, if they like them, I'm going to give them a chance. And it just, it's using your platform, if you will, to, to, to shine a light on someone you believe in, which I think is what uh, bringing an opening act is all about. At least that's what it used to be about. But now it's yeah. become this thing where it's like, oh, I want to buy on and you're going to get the, this many eyeballs on you. It's like, no, it's supposed to be fun. So that sounds like a fun night. And I, and I think this is going to be a really, really a fun tour for people to come see. I think people need fun after the last couple of years, people need to laugh. Back wood. Time. And uh, I can't wait personally to see what you're going to do to Steely Dan. That's, <laughs> that's my, that's my, that's my. We're going to make Fagan. And what was the other dude's name? Becker. Becker. Mm. Regret they ever wrote that fucking song. That's what we're going to do. 
Uh, may I say something before we drive uh, out of sight like Santa Claus? Uh, Spike, I just want to definitely say that after all these years, I'd like to personally thank you for and the Gimme Gimmies for exposing my closed minded dumbass generation to music that is not <laughs> just punk rock and, um, you know, get down with the Manilow and all these other tunes. And CJ, I'm so glad you're in the band now, but I realize you're com- Me too. extremely overqualified for your position considering for decades now you've uh, been rocking punk covers because i think ramones created the, the non-punk punk cover <laughs> and you have absolutely no quims about all dressing alike so that's amazing i'm really glad you're in the band <laughs> i don't think anybody involved in music ever traveled the road that i have from wearing the uniform of the yeah. 70s punk rocker to the uniform of the gimme gimme yeah, yeah what do you mean all that <laughs> I know what you call it. You call it American Schlager. My wife, Audra, <laughs> is the one that does our costumes. And I don't know if you're familiar with German Schlager culture, no. but that's essentially what it is. It's American Schlager is what it is. <laughs> Thanks for taking Trash. the time, guys. I appreciate uh, you both <laughs> taking the time. And uh, it was a pleasure chatting with you both today. Continued success. And uh, and enjoy yourselves out there. I think we've all, um, you know, everybody's earned uh, They've, they've everybody's earned a chance to go out and have fun now um i think yeah. we've all we've all you know we've i've all, earned the right to be a genuine shit to everybody i see man that's what i'm gonna do please continue to be one although that's yeah. the furthest thing from the truth from my experiences thanks guys thank you appreciate it man uh yeah so did not expect cj ramon to be there to show that up was, uh, did, are you that, kidding me no I didn't expect that at all. I, I was, was like, at first, but then I started studying like, his face and I'm, and like, I'm like, that's CJ Ramon. Like, was he fucking around or not? I had no idea he was playing with me first in the gimme gimme. So that was kind of a, a, a bit of a shock. Well, even if Spike would bring him with them, like, you know, not like this interview is about me. It's like, Hey, CJ, come sit. He sings like a bird, but he's so smart too. And I'm just like, this yeah. is why I like this the fact that this medium exists and that a conversation could go long enough where all these terrains could be touched oh yeah and and, and this is the thing like like i mentioned when we when we started chatting um i really uh i i met him in the most um non meeting a band member Mm -hmm. way i mean i met him in catering at 77 montreal with melanie who uh, melanie k who's a, a publicist and and um she was responsible for you know she's responsible for a lot of bands that are on on fat rack and and she does a lot of really great stuff and she was like hey i want you to meet a friend of mine spike from me first in the gimme gimme's and i was like oh hey what's up man and we just chatted about food and montreal and all kinds of things and i just genuinely really really enjoyed chatting with him so um yeah that was cool but i had no fucking idea that he was going to bring cj ramon with him i didn't look who was playing in the band now really to be honest because there it's such a revolving Mm. door but when I saw him show, I was like, what the yeah. fuck, man? That was that, that threw me for a loop at first. I, and you see it when we're chatting. I mean, we're both kind of like, oh, my God. He, that, like, Oh, my God. Oh, fuck. You know, it's like. Yeah. And there's so many things that pop in my head. I'm like, I, I'm like, CJ, you've done everything. You've played in one of the greatest bands in the world. Do you, uh, you know, you're covered. When you played the solo shows, as he said, him and Daniel Ray, a producer of the last few Ramones albums, they yeah. played everything at the proper speed. Like they didn't do that ultra, you know, blasting through every song until they're almost unrecognizable thing that the Ramones were doing up to yeah. their last days. CJ actually told me once, but I'd prefer him to come back on the show as a guest and tell it yeah. in his own words. A funny story of why they played the song so fast. But um yeah, I just I want to tell him I'm like, man, you are the only person in 33 years of The Simpsons who has ever told old Mr. Burns to go to hell, you old bastard. <laughs> and that's something fucking monumental. Yeah, that's that, that's pretty cool. Um, well, that was a lot of fun, man. And I want to encourage everybody. I know that we rushed to get this up because uh, me first and the Gimme Gimme's are playing Montreal this Sunday night, October 9th. Uh, this is going to be an incredible show. You don't want to miss it. And uh, I'm very, very curious to see what they're going to do to Steely Dan. I got to say, you know, I you know how much I love Steely Dan. They're one of my favorite yeah. bands in the world. So, And the thing is with Steely Dan, I was trying to say it to the guys. There's a lot more going on about Ste- with Steely Dan than you think. I think a lot of people think Steely Dan are just this AM rock band that have no substance to them, but there's a lot of substance to them. But 
that's what makes the world a beautiful place is uh, different opinions and all that great stuff. Um, mm. Thank you, Ryan. That was fun. It was really, really fun no, to no, be. Thank to, you, Jason. Thanks yeah. for including me in this one. I'm really, it's, it is amazing to keep our fat mic interview has been doing great. And I'm so grateful for that one too, but it's just, it's incredible because this is my genre of music, man. Yeah, like you're talking about faith no more. We, you, you've been interviewing all your heroes as of late, but now I'm getting to as well, because like, <laughs> no, that whole fat rec scene, that was, that was, that was the music. That was the music my heartbeat was at, you know? Yeah. Like my, right, my right. friends and I, we lived and died by those fat records bands and stuff. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, you know, stick with me, kid. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also want to thank uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce for uh, being incredible sponsors. This is the uh, Poirier's Louisiana style KO edition. And if you don't know, Dustin Poirier is going to be fighting again in November. And we're hoping to try to do something with him um, in 2023 and with Heartbeat. Um, but if you want to go try some of this beautiful heartbeat hot sauce and uh, try Dustin's Louisiana style KO edition. This one really, really slaps Um, right here, right below there. Boom. Rockman 20 and you'll get 20% off your entire hot sauce order. And that code you can use over and over and over again. Give it to your grandmother, give it to your friends, give it to everyone that you love and uh, tell them to uh, enter it as they check out. They'll get 20% off their entire order. Heartbeat hot sauce. Thank you. Just tell them where you heard it, kid. Tell them you heard it at the Rockman Power Hour. Mm. That's right. And uh, thanks to heart uh, to our friends at Studio House Designs. Ryan's rocking the SLC Punk shirt. And I am uh, going Canadian with some Cronenberg and some scanners. They're great, too. So check them out at uh, studiohousedesigns.com. Uh, my thanks to my co-host, Ryan Stick, and uh, to our producer, Julia Kajerski. And until next week, we'll see you on the Rockman Power Hour. <laughs>